first uh, speaker of the science and other uh, associated uh, part of the meeting is Mark Buey. And Mark has uh, two presentations to make. One is uh, chasing the occultations of a Kuiper Belt object called 2014 MU69. And the other one is the current status of the recon uh, project and future plans. And thank you very much for sharing these things with us. Sure. Thanks a lot, Roger. Thanks for the uh, the invite to come talk. It's always great to see you guys in the flesh and not just uh, by email. But uh, it's been uh, it's been a crazy year. Um, I we we had. Um, I guess you can go on to the to the next. In uh, late 2016, we identified three potential candidate stars for occultations with 2014 MU69, which I hope you all know is the target, the next target for close flyby of the New Horizon spacecraft. We're going to fly by on January 1st, 2019, UT. It's right near the cusp of the year, and it's it's. Uh, I think they're actually, we're going to be retargeting the, the arrival time so that it's pretty much, it, we don't change dates in the U.S. <laughs> um, but anyway, we, we found these three stars, and um, the, at the time, the predictions weren't all that good. We just knew which side of the Earth was dark and would, would see these events, but uh, there were potentials here for, for working on this. I thought somebody else was going to be in charge of this and run the project because I was too busy um, with my, all of my projects. But come February, nothing had been done. And it was time somebody had to step up. And I figured, OK, I guess I got to do this. So since February, I basically haven't been working on anything but this particular project here. Um, it's pretty tough to have a six-month thing drop, pull it, you know, right on your schedule when you've got all, you know, 20 other things you got to keep doing. But it's been a blast, and uh, I'll, I want to cover some of the high points. There's there's a lot to cover here, and um, I don't have a final story yet, but I want to go through this. But that's just the general overview. The first one on June 3rd was visible from South America and Africa. And it's a faint star, 15th magnitude. We knew it was going to be a challenge. July 10 was also was the faintest of the three, um, mostly just visible from the Pacific. It does cross over into South America. The kiss of death on this one was that it was just 10 degrees away from a full moon. And I was not interested in any spending any um, resources to do an international deployment into a green country, which I'm allergic to green for occultations. I like nice brown countries. <laughs> um, so uh, I managed, we, so we didn't really do a full deployment. I never intended to send anybody to do the July 10 event, but I would just, every time they asked, well, are we going to send somebody? I said, well, we'll see, we'll see. But I never wanted to send anybody there. And then finally, July 17 is the brightest star crossing the southern tip of uh, South America. And that was where I had most of my hopes set, because that's where I thought we were going to get our best data. We ended up getting, um, let's see, go we'll ahead to the next uh, slide. Um, so for, for um, June 3rd, we did a full-up uh, ground-based deployment. And when started looking at this, uh, like in February, it was, what telescopes are we going to use? What cameras are we going to use? We didn't have any equipment. No ideas, no concepts, anything other than a general knowledge of how to do occultations. And uh, so I sat down and looked at it, looked at the uncertainties we were likely to get, and what we needed to do, and I basically said, look, you're going to need to go out and buy 20 telescopes. Um, do you got enough money for that? We're going to have to ship them internationally. Do you have enough money for that? We're going to have to have lots of people. And so Alan Stern, as the principal investigator, worked with NASA headquarters and raised over 800 k to support all of these 
op operations here, including buying all the equipment. It's one of the most expensive under occultation undertakings I've ever been part of, but we could not have done it without spending all of this money. So tested the, the, um, the Skywatcher 16-inch um, computer-controlled Dobsonian. That is a very nice uh, telescope for the price. Um, it's got, you know, a few rough edges here and there, but if you pay attention to how to use it, it can do some great stuff for you. Um, then the camera that we got, this uh, QHY-174 GPS, I love this thing. It's got a GPS built into it, and every image it takes is time tagged, and so time is not a problem. We've been verifying that with the Sexta, but on this event, time is everything. It turns out that all of the interesting stuff that's coming out here has to do with time. And we don't understand what's going on yet, but we at least we're not doubting the time and the data. Okay, so we sent 13 systems to South Africa, and they basically started near Cape Town, but they kind of went north to Clan William, and then things happened and they were elsewhere as well. But we also had 12 systems to Argentina, we bought 22 of these sky watchers, and then we got three extra systems from the University of Virginia that traveled as part of the equipment. Then, for July 10, we got time with Sophia. We actually were granted time for all three occultations. But we looked at the first one, and at the time, given what our projections were for the uncertainty in the uh, event prediction, there was the, the uncertainty was just too large to justify flying Sophia to that. And we gave up on that one, that opportunity almost immediately. July 10 was the easiest one to get to, not totally trivial, but we could do it in this, what they call a single flight, where you take off, fly, do your science observations and land back where you started. Um, July 17, the uncertainty was quite large at the time, and there were many options that would require a double, um, a double leg deployment. Basically, you fly out and you get to the place where you have to do the science, but you've gone too far to get back to where you started. So you have to land at some intermediate location, stop, refuel, rest, then fly back. And so the, the flight cost is twice as high for that. And the project office was very, very reticent to spend that kind of money on this. Even though it was the brightest star, we pushed really, really hard, but we just couldn't convince them to do this event. Um, but this is happening during the Southern Hemisphere deployment for 2017 for Sophia, so they were actually flying out of Christchurch. Um, I'll show you the flight path here in a second. So then the third event is, um, as I said, was in southern Argentina. Um, we eventually ended up going to Comodoro Rivadavia, which is a coastal city right on the southern end of uh, the Chubut province. And uh, <clears throat> its motto or nickname is the City of the Wind. <laughs> so that was a little scary. We were talking to Argentinians about this, and this, including one guy that lives in southern Santa Cruz province, and the geologist who actually helped out us on the June 3rd event. He, when we, we had a telecon with him, and we're, we're talking to him and telling him what we wanted to do, and he said, July in Patagonia? Are you nuts? This is insane. It's, it's snowy, it's cold, it's windy, it's, it's horrible. Come back in January. <laughs> so, darn, I'm glad you get the joke. That's, <laughs> I usually have to explain that, as I did to him. And I said, ah, this is it. You know, we either give up or we give it a shot. And I started investigating it. But what this means is, notice they had 13 systems in South Africa. We had to ship those after we were done on June 3rd, we had to ship them to Argentina to get everybody together so we had all the equipment in Argentina. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, here's just a little bit of, of where the, the uncertainties are going. I, I, um, this is a, a taste of things to come. This is the kind of stuff that we're going to be starting to deal with once the Gaia DR2 catalog comes out. And the fact that we were successful with this is entirely due to the fact that we had access 
early access to the Gaia DR2 catalog. Without that, this would have been impossible. So May 25th, you see on this table, I've listed each row in the table, shows the three events that we were looking at. Back when we had the data from May 25th, May 25A orbit, was all of the Hubble data that we had through May 25th. And it was the first, one of the first orbits that we had done using Gaia DR2. And the uncertainty, the cross-track uncertainty for that one in May 25th for the June 3rd event was one and a half million arc seconds. That's really amazing. Now, I, I put in the upper right-hand corner of the slide uh, a cheat sheet there, 34 kilometers is equal to one milli arc second. And then we're kind of thinking this object was maybe about 40 kilometers across. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to have a chance of seeing this and getting enough stations and then covering the uncertainty ellipse, this is where we needed to be. Okay. So as you see, LC1G are actually not G2, but um, we had a um, 20 orbit, 20 orbits of Hubble time that executed just before we did that, but ending on July 4th. So we had 120 new images of the object over about 10 days, trying to do measure the light curve of MU69 to see if we could pick up a rotation period. We didn't see anything, and that fit, feeds into the mystery that you'll see when I get a little further down. Um, but it improved the, the orbit precision quite a bit. So you can see in LC1GR, the cross-track uncertainty is now down to 0.42. 420 micro arc seconds, yes. We can now start using that term. <laughs> it's really exciting. Okay. And, but see, we didn't have LC1GR to do June 3rd. This is now a post-diction to say, given this improved orbit, this is where we are. And that's also part of the story. But we had LC1GR, which was what we used to support the deployment of SOFIA for July 10 and for July 17. So as you can see, we had the one sigma uncertainty down to about 12 kilometers. Now we've gotten a couple of other measurements, and this RF3A is our current provisional orbit, which includes astrometry from the occultation itself on July 17. And a few more Hubble measurements in late August. And you'll see that the uncertainty has dropped yet again, for another, about another factor of two. Has the guy at Neem released any data for the template itself? The, um, has the, has Gaia re released any data for the asteroid itself? R recognize that Gaia is a flux limited survey. Anything that's fainter than 20th magnitude is not transmitted to the ground. And this, this object is about 27th. Okay. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Hubble can barely detect this thing. Okay. <laughs> we've, we've tried to observe this with Keck, Gemini, um, I'm not sure, we haven't actually used VLT, but they don't really have the, the best equipment for seeing this, but... Uh, um, so, why are we going to <laughs> it's the only thing, why we're going there, it's the only thing along the path of New Horizons that we can get to given the fuel we have. We found one object. Now, if that doesn't make a spacecraft flying team just wicked nervous, you know, we found it just in time. You know, basically we had, we needed to find it a year before Pluto encounter, and I was working on this for 10 years, and we found it just in time. If we hadn't, if we'd have found it even a couple of months later, we wouldn't have enough arc length on the orbit to determine the orbit so that we can get the spacecraft there. You put a spinnaker, uh, <laughs> well, you know, you, you know what would have been great? is if we'd have had twice as much fuel on board. <laughs> but you had to decide that back when you were building and, and fueling the spacecraft. And we thought, ah, oh, there's lots of Kuiper Belt objects out there. Surely there's another, you know, we'll have our choice of Kuiper Belt object. And as it turns out, there was one. If we'd have doubled the fuel, we would have had a choice of four. 
you double the fuel again, I mean, it's a geometric progression, so you could have had lots and lots of choices, and you could have gone to see multiple objects. We did not know enough about the Kuiper belt at the time we were building the spacecraft. That's how fast our knowledge is, is growing about the Kuiper belt, but it takes a long time to get across the solar system. So, um, next slide. So the, the, each one of these events had different goals because of the equipment that we had, where we were located. Um, in this particular case, that's the one with the worst uncertainty at the time of the deployment. And I could not cover all the bases for all possible sizes and configurations of the object. And I, what I chose to do was to concentrate on, on um, ruling out the large and dark case. So this would be like a 40 kilometer object which would have like a 4% albedo. If that's what the object is like, we would have to change all of the um, exposure times and imaging sequences for New Horizons as it flies by because the signal to noise wouldn't be high enough. We would be taking these dim pictures and we'd be wasting our time. So if we can figure out what the albedo is, we can tweak up our imaging sequences. And as long as it's not at the lowest end of the range, our sequences are pretty robust. So that was what I wanted to focus on. Can we detect or rule out the large and dark case? Okay. So we um, had, the had the opportunity to use two continents, so we did because if, you, if the weather's bad in South Africa, it, might, it could be good in Argentina or vice versa. Um, and rather than putting all your eggs in one basket, just having it in one place, I did have to fight that. There were people who were saying, the weather in Africa will be perfect. Send everybody there. And I said, sorry, <laughs> I'm not doing that. I don't care what you say. I'm going to take my chances on two continents. Um, so the, the other part is to search for extra material around it. We're worried about hazards for the New Horizons spacecraft. So if there's rings like we see around Chiriclo, um, and if you want to know about those, if there's uh, diffuse dust um, structures around it, kind of like what we see around Chiron and, and uh, Eschiclus, these centaurs that are out there, um, we would want to know that too. So these probes through watching the star, if we see a dip that's not from the solid body, that tells us that there's something dangerous there that we have to worry about. This was not the best experiment for that, so that was why it was a secondary goal. But it, was, it, it also determined the time span over which we collected data. We knew that this event was going to be only like one or two seconds long, but we took 45 minutes worth of data to cover the stability region around MU69, plus or minus 30,000 kilometers. Um, and so just a couple more numbers to keep in mind. At the time of these occultations, it's, the object is 43 AU away from us. Um, at that scale, again, what one kilometer is 32 micro arc seconds. So keep that in mind. And the star position that we we're getting from Gaia on this occultation was good to 100 micro arc seconds. And uh, the cross track error for this one was 44 kilometers, and the timing error was like 3.3 seconds, one sigma. Okay, next. <clears throat> So the deployment, as I've already described, um, there's the equipment. We were basically doing uh, two frames a second with this camera, um, getting a signal to noise of about five per image. But that depended a lot on the image quality and also um, whether there were clouds or sky brightness issues. So some of the um, data sets are just amazingly good. Some of the, the best sites in Africa had really, really good seeing and very dark skies. And you know, it looks like it was taken with a two meter telescope, so very, very clean signal. And some others were dealing with bright skies and bad seeing and were kind of ratty, but they were all good enough to see a solid body occultation. Um, the, th the amazing thing is that 
everybody that went out with a working system, we, we lost one telescope due to shipping problems. The mirror came loose from its mount and we couldn't use it. So we had 24 that actually went out to collect photons. Everybody got useful data at the midtime. Some were affected by clouds, but nobody was wiped out. That's amazing. <clears throat> Absolutely amazing. Um, but we didn't see anything. It's like, oh my God, what are we going to do? We put in all this effort. We should have seen it. The odds were that there was only a 3% chance of a null result for a 40 kilometer object. So when I saw that, it's like, okay, we've ruled out the big and dark case. You guys don't have to worry about 4% albedo anymore. It's probably small. And that's why we missed it. But that's a really unsatisfying thing to plan on, is not having data. But fortunately, we've got two more events to, to chase down. This, by the way, for those of you who are involved, is one of the reasons why we were kind of slow with getting press releases and results out, because, you know, <laughs> NASA wants to do good messaging on this kind of stuff, and we want to get it right, and we didn't know what happened. Okay. So the, that's kind of the first mystery, is what happened on June 3rd, why we didn't see it. And so I'll get back to that in a second. So go to the next. This is the picket fence that we managed to achieve. The red dots here on this plot, the two on the extreme left and the one on the extreme right, those are fixed telescopes. There's two bands of dots. The upper dots are the Argentina picket fence, and the bottom set of red dots is the South Africa picket fence. And you see we're covering this region. And so the center green line is the nominal prediction. And the next pair of blue lines, that's the one sigma contour. And then the next, the red one, is two sigma. And then the green one on the outside edge, that's three sigma. And I wrote some software to do a Monte Carlo um, estimation of the odds for a given size of object, what would happen given this, the noise properties that we've got here. And that's what I based my uh, deployment on. OK. So we see we covered sort of plus or minus 100 kilometers. And as I said, already came up empty. All right, so go on to the next. So on to July 10. We come back home, we're processing data, get it, get everything out. We don't have anything. All right, let's get ready. Now we got all this Hubble data to process like crazy. Simon Porter and I were really busy with that, and we timed our flights for when the data is being transmitted and processed at Hubble so that by the time we got to New Zealand, the new data is ready to go so that we can turn the crank on it. And um, so we had to fly to Christchurch. Um, that's where the, Sophia was flying out of. That was really cool. Uh, this is my first and maybe my only time to ever fly on Sophia, but that was a, that was a real blast. Landing in, in, in uh, Christchurch, we got to the airport, and you're just sitting in the airplane looking out the window like you do. And I'm looking, wow, look at that. That's an old 747 sitting over there. I wonder, what, I wonder why it's there. <laughs> and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm half sleep addled, right? It's, I've been, it's flying from Denver. It's been 100 hours. I don't know. But I'm just looking at it and saying, wait a minute. Gas Sophia, I'm going to be on that tomorrow night. That well, was really cool. <laughs> um, okay, but with Sophia, now weather's not a factor, supposedly. <laughs> okay, you get above, you're flying at 40,000 feet, and you can put the aircraft where you need it. As long as it's within range, you're good to go. And this was going to be our experiment covering, again, 45 minutes around the occultation time to search for the ring material. And that was the number one thing that we were going for. NASA really liked this because we're guaranteed to get a result. They were really afraid that what we were after is the solid body event, and I couldn't prove to them what the odds of having success there would be. 
And if they, the numbers that we had, you know, for like a, if it's a 10 kilometer object, the odds would have been like 5% that we would see a solid body. If it's 40%, it turned out that it, the odds were about 80% that we would see a solid body. But we didn't know how big it was at that time, but it didn't matter because the solid body was a secondary goal. Okay. But I got, to, I talked to the pilots beforehand and I said, look, this is what we got to do. I need you to get this aircraft right in this latitude and longitude at this time. And they tell me what elevation that they're going to fly at, so I took that into account. And I want you to hit that within a kilometer and within a second. And our eyes got big, and then they got to work. <laughs> and believe it or not, the Sophia system does not have tools to make that possible. <laughs> If they had a heads-up display or any kind of a feedback on all the navigation tools that says keep the plane on the dot, like they do with, you know, like glide slope indicators, they'll tell you whether you're too low or too high, that makes it easy. They don't have any of that, so they had to kind of invent a protocol with the mission operations, and they're chattering back and forth between the flight operations the whole all the way through. It was it was it was really fun to listen to, and they nailed it, absolutely nailed it. And that's going to be another part of the mystery of the story. Okay, so let's move on. <coughs> There's the flight path. We took off from Christchurch, basically flew north, a little bit to the east, turned around, came back down, and then we did our science leg. Um, we were just south of, I think it was, I don't, I don't remember the names of all these islands, but, but uh, I think it was either Tahiti or Fuji, Fiji or something like that. Anyway, that was really cool. We didn't see anything. So, go on to the next slide. We did have issues with weather. Um, there was actually a region just north of Auckland that had a um, report, a forecast of severe turbulence. And the, at the altitude range the aircraft needed to fly to get out, we couldn't go under or over or around the side because of fuel and timing issues. So we're sitting on the tarmac in Christchurch wondering if we can take off. And the only way that they would clear us to go is if they got a report from a pilot in a different plane flying through that region saying, ah, it's nothing to worry about, it's fine. And we had 30 minutes of extra buffer in the schedule for that purpose, and we used 15 minutes of that, and we finally got two reports that everything's fine, so we took off. But, you know, that's like the first indication that something weird's going on. <laughs> okay, so the results, we didn't see any diffuse material rings. No obvious solid body signature. Now, I'm not being definitive here because there's something weird. We don't understand it. And until I do, I'm not going to really trot it out. It could be just a data artifact or something like that. But we're working on it. But there's nothing that stands out as, hey, here I was. And we were at the right place at the right time. Okay, get back to the implications of that in a second. So let's move on to July 17. So do we strike out? Are we going to strike out? You know, third time of thing and get out there and do this again? Because now we have just one observing location. And everybody is within 100 kilometers of each other. And so all it would take is one poorly timed storm and you know, we're done. We don't get anything. And we would just have these mysteries and we would never know what we're getting to. Um, but the solid body event was a top priority. And we needed to, um, I wanted to cover a larger uncertainty range. My Monte Carlo modeling was saying I only needed to go out to 2.2 sigma. And I said, well, I don't know what's going on. There's something else working in here, so let's be more conservative. So I was pushing it out to more like four and a half sigma. Okay, think about how many times you've ever gone out to do an occultation and you're covering out the four and a half sigma. It doesn't happen, right? But uh, we had gotten the uncertainty down to such a small range that I didn't need to tighten up the grid arbitrarily tight. I could have run much tighter, but I wanted to cover more ground to make sure that I wasn't going to miss anything. So, next. 
Um, so the spacing, as it turned out, was about four to four, four to five kilometers between stations, which means that if it was a five kilometer object, with super high albedo, we could be in trouble. But I, I had to take, you know, I had to take some chances there. Um, and the center line passed right over Comodoro Rivadavia, which is the city that we went to. We didn't know that was going to happen. I had to pick about a month and a half out where we're going to fly to. And again, this is one of these things that there were two candidates, Trelau, Trelu, Trelu, or Comodoro, the places we could fly into. And at the time, I would say it was like a 60-40 chance, 60% chance of Commodore being the right place and Trelu being 40% chance. Trelu would have been a lot easier for many ways, better access and it's not as far. But I had to go with my gut on this one and I went with Commodore. I'm glad I did. Um, the longest cord that we saw was one second long. And the shortest was 0.3 seconds. We were taking data at five frames per second. So that means the short cords was one frame with the star missing and another frame with a partial drop. And the shape is not simple. Um, that's the thing that jumped out at us immediately. So next slide. Um, there's something weird going on here. So it's, yeah, so this is all the cords. Okay, now the the jagged edges here don't. It, it, what it's showing you is the time shift between stations. So that's the longitude factor in here, and then the latitude factor is running up through the middle. Um, You can see the, 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 the topmost line with the yellow dots. The third line above that was the one that I was manning. Um, so I was like six or eight kilometers away from the action. But uh, we got five cords. And you can see these, uh, they're short on the top, then two that are about the same length, and then one long one, and another short one. Um, I didn't put it in the slides, but you'll you'll. Is anybody wondering what the gap is? <laughs> What's the gap? <laughs> we had a station. It's a good lesson. We had the station in that location that would have gotten an occultation. They got on the field, set up. Everything's fine. The beginning of the data is perfect, and they said, this is too, I, I don't want to be outside in the cold and the wind. The telescope's working great. So they went and sat in the cab of the truck, the observing team, for 45 minutes. 10 minutes after they got in the cab of the truck, the field drifted, the star drifted out of the field of the camera. And it was Creature Comfort's one out over data on this particular one, but just, you know, you have to respect the weather conditions, but that's why we had two people. You know, can't you have one looking at it? And so what ha really happened was they got the wrong message. I said, in the two minutes around the event time, don't guide, don't touch it. Make sure that it's going to be good through that two minutes without guiding. The rest of the time, you know, whenever you're guiding it, the image gets a little smeary and it's not as good. So you're, you've got 20 minutes to understand how this thing is guiding and working. And then so that you can anticipate and put it in a good place so it's got two minutes during the important time where you don't have to touch it and then you get back on guiding again. I never said you could go away. This is why we flew you here. Okay, so there's some people in the room that already know who it was. And for those of you that weren't there, it was the principal investigator of New Horizons that was one of these people, one of the team members. <laughs> and I had the, dis the dubious pleasure of that morning going down and saying, Alan, <laughs> what were you guys doing? <laughs> 
But I can't make him feel too bad about this. I mean, you can't beat people up for making mistakes. You hope that they learn from it, and the next time out, they'll never do that again. So I've got my fingers crossed. So far, I don't think the lack of that data is crippling our ability to understand what we've got home. I'd love to have it, but we got a great data set here. Okay, so as you can see, you're, you're used to looking at chords. Jeez, I mean, what kind of shape do you see in there? When, when I looked at this, my immediate reaction was it's a, it's a binary. It's two circular objects overlapping, meaning they're in the middle of a mutual event, even better. And then I was telling people that on like the next day when I'm showing them all this. And, oh, no, 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 it could be a single object, and it could just be weird shape, and it could be a contact binary, and they have valid points, and we've been analyzed that, so go on to the next step. So, it could be a single object if it is. It's like 34 by 20 kilometers. Okay, now remember I said Hubble was doing light curve observations and we haven't yet found a light curve. If it's that irregular, it means that we have to be kind of looking down on the pole of the rotation to keep the light curve amplitude from being too large. Turns out that if you work the numbers, the probability of that is not crazy. You can defend that. It, it's got to be within 45 degrees of the pole. So the odds are kind of okay. You, you can't just rule it out um, just on that. Could be a contact binary. The size is kind of about the same, but the, the origins and the shapes and declivities that you might see in it might make a little more sense with a contact binary. Again, you have to hide a light curve. Okay, and the other option is a close binary. And if it is a close binary, then my fitting says that it's a 20 kilometer and a 16 kilometer nearly spherical object. It, it is, it does appear to be elliptical slightly. So if it's a single object, wouldn't it tumble with that kind of weird shape and then the light curve would kind of pull that up? So if it's a single object, would it tumble? Um, <clears throat> We, this, these are pretty big objects. Um, then they're not subject to perturbations, things like that. You know, I, I looked at it. It's not very likely that it's in non-principal axis rotation. Um, that's not a guarantee, but it's more, much more likely for it to be in a normal rotation. But. I personally have lots and lots of problems with the single object. There's just, you look at those, those outlines, there's just huge gouges, all sorts of weird things, and I just, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that as, a, as an option. We're still working it, but right now my bias is against that, but we're, we're trying to see what we can do to, to rule it out or rule it in. And I'll tell you right now, we don't have the answer. I, I just have what my preference is. Okay, so um, in all these cases, it turns out the albedo is about 10 percent, 9 or 10 percent in the you know, invisible. So next slide. Is that relatively high and low? It's uh, the most likely albedo, based on the limited information we have for these kinds of objects, is about 20 percent. So it's a little on the low side. But uh, so anyway, so there's these pictures that you may have seen in the um, uh, press releases that came out in NASA. Um, two objects, either it's a close binary that's in a mutual event on the left, or it's the single object on the right. Um, but we have some open questions. So June 3rd, we missed. We now have a better postdiction. What happened? Well, it turns out that our southernmost station was about 20 kilometers away from the center line. So we just missed it. Now, we don't know why the uncertainties said that, it sh that the odds of that happening apparent based on our uncertainties, um, that's the wrong answer. We had poor uncertainties. Now, if I can inflate our uncertainties by a factor of two, the problem goes away. But we really thought we had it right. And it turns out that it's choosing which data that we took from Hubble 
what's good data and what's bad data mm -hmm. is a very hard thing to determine. And usually, it, you can just kind of wing it and just do it by intuition and seat of the pants. And um, you, there's usually good enough, good enough data that it doesn't matter. But it turns out it does matter, and we're still working on that particular problem. These are different stars. So you have to also consider the option that Gaia data could have been different for different stars as well. Right? Well, the Gaia tells us what the uncertainties are, right. and we take that at face value. So they, yeah, they were all DR2? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of the three stars, the one with the largest uncertainty was the last one. Okay. <laughs> and it's and we're hoping that they'll actually do better than that um, because it's a bright enough star. Once they get enough data, they'll, it'll probably will be better. But there's more. June third, one of the fixed sites, if you remember from Picket Fence, off to the left was SAAO, this South African Astrophysical Observatory. They were only eight kilometers away from the center line. And they didn't see anything. All right, what's going on there? And then when I first looked at that, it says, oh, well, it might have just rotated the contact binary. And you got the, the little one was in the gap between SAO and our southernmost station. And you do the math, and it's, nope, that can't happen. That gap is too small. We would have seen it at one or the other, which means that the entire system has to be off to the south, which means we have a bigger error than I can tolerate on the quality of the orbit prediction for the post diction there. We do not have a resolution for this, but it's a deep mystery to be sorted out for June 3rd. <coughs> July 10, we missed. Based on the last, most the, the, the RF-3A um, orbit, the best one that we've got so far, which is still preliminary, we got within two kilometers of the object, the center one. Two kilometers. And we didn't see anything. How does that work? So I like the idea that it's a contact binary and it just opened up and we flew through the middle. <laughs> What's that? Uh, that <laughs> yeah, so Sophia's in the club. <laughs> but there are problems with that and uh, we're still working that issue. But I kind of like the idea of it being flying through the middle. And that makes it consistent there, but it doesn't fix June 3rd. And the final thing, which is a word that's cut off here, explain the tension between HST and occultation astrometry. So when I put the two together, they don't hang together at the level that I would like. Even after we add the occultation astrometry as a constraint and look and see what that predicts for the July 17 event, the cloud of, of chords is off by two and a half sigma. Now, sigma is really tiny at this point, but it's still two and a half sigma. And I want to see that kind of nestled in the one sigma zone to feel happy about it. But we have all this Hubble data that's a certain kind of data based on the you know astrometric images and Gaia stars. And then we have an occultation measurement, which is a different beast. You think you know what you're doing, but maybe maybe there's something that we're doing wrong. How, how, uh, how close is HST guiding DR2? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a we got a, the entire path of MU69 from discovery through the end of 2018. We have that catalog already. So millions million stars or something like that. So. We don't know what's going on there, and therein lies the mystery. Um, and so we're looking at what do we do about this? Is it going to affect the mission? Is it going to affect targeting? We've got a year left to get more data, and so we're kind of thinking, well, we'll get, Hubble's our only tool, and then maybe occultations. Yep. So you're, you're talking about threading the needle, the pillars of Hercules. Now, how, how big was the star? Do we have a good idea of how big the star was in our seconds? Uh, 
Um, that, that could be computed. I don't know how to do that, so I've got all the data. We've got parallax, we have um, proper motion, we have colors from Gaia, we have everything that you need to do that exact calculation. But judging from the occultation data itself, there is no evidence for a resolved stellar diameter in the data. Yeah, and I think it's even less than that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, how soon will the horizon be able to image M69? So it'll be able to detect how soon will it be able to New Horizon C is, well, I'm getting that. <laughs> um, so in August of 2018 is the first opportunity we're going to try to detect it. But it will just be a very, very low signal to noise blip on the image, and we won't be able to resolve it. The more interesting question is when would you be able to resolve this pair? That's about three days out. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> you can improve the astrometry as soon as you detect it, right? Yeah, there's, there, the, the, the astrometry can be improved. And we, there's, there's an, what we call an OpNav, optical navigation campaign that we're going to run on New Horizons, which takes us from what Hubble can do to what we need for the encounter. And we're depending on that. Um, but there's actually the time of flight, when we get at the time of close approach, that information comes exclusively from Hubble, which is very different from I mean, these, these navigators are just going berserk because they like to do a clean slate solution for navigation so that they're, they don't have any polluting outside data and they're going to have to trust the work that we've done on this and it's making them really nervous. But if we missed on July 17, I don't know if I would have had any credibility left in that group. <laughs> but we got it. <laughs> and cross track it was pretty good. Yeah. How do we know that Hubble's timing is accurate is the question. Well I, in Hubble, Hubble was never put up with accurate time base. How do we know that Hubble's time base is good? Well, in fact, I have got more than 25 years of working with Hubble data, and my first project was doing astrometry of the pluto charon system, and we dug into the timing even back then. That was second year after it was launched, and it is actually quite good. Um, we, we, work, we, do, we know where the noise floor is on this, but it doesn't limit our um, for Kuiper Belt objects, it, it is, doesn't limit what we can do. So, so what's next? Mm -hmm. uh, we're missing the, the, the label here oh. somehow or another, but... There's a green country there. Green. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, this is uh, an event that I identified out of the catalog that Gaia sent me, um, August 4th, 2018. Mark your calendars. And this is a 13th magnitude star, so pretty nice. There's no particular problem with the moon. It's just where's the shadow? <laughs> so go to the next one. I'm going to zoom in on the two regions. South America is next. And the, the solid lines show you a 30 kilometer diameter footprint. And the dashed lines show a 100 kilometer footprint for how we think the object components might spread out. So I still have to cover that kind of, that kind of zone. And the country on the left, you may, if you can read it, says Bogota, so that's yeah. Colombia. The next one is Venezuela. Yeah. I'm not going to Venezuela. <laughs> and then the next is Guyana and Suriname. They're very green looking. Yeah. <laughs> the, the eastern portion of Colombia looks pretty well deforested, so I don't know, maybe we could work there. And I've already found a road that would do pretty well um, east of Bogota that maybe would be kind of okay and safe. So Colombia is actually worth considering. Um, and I'm, I don't know as much about Guyana and Suriname. But uh, they may not be quite so bad. But it's still, it's the green countries. So go to the next one. That's where the drug loads, too. Yeah, we've been having conversations like that. So here's the other end of the track. 
going over Africa. So it crosses the coast just south of Dakar. So that's the black dot you see there right on the 100 kilometer line. Goes through Senegal, then southeastern Mauritania, then into Mali, and then Algeria is in there. And I think it's Libya that's the next one, right? Yeah. These are all kind of scary countries, I have to say. But they're exquisitely brown, <laughs> except for Senegal. Senegal is kind of a, you know, halfway between. But holy cow, you go right straight across the heart of the Sahara here. So we're going to be talking with NASA headquarters, and maybe we're going to be talking with the State Department and the military, and who knows? We could have, maybe we could do airdrop astrometry, you know, just start uh, our occultation, you know, push us out of plane and land, do it, and they come back and pick us up. And I don't know. This is going to get exciting, but we're starting now. Not we're not going to wait till June next year. And I don't know if it's going to be feasible to actually pull this off or not, but we are starting to talk and see if we can pull together another amazing expedition. So I think that's the last slide in this presentation. Can you back the full term? All right. Yeah, so uh, how, did, how did you get to, where did your team members come from, the 50 people? Where did the team members come from? Yes, well, I have two pictures that I've added for you. That ah, time. yes, that is a... <laughs> then here, you yeah. about the team members right there. You see me with my luggage? <laughs> That's not normal. <laughs> you don't go on Sophia with your luggage. When we took off, the, the forecast for landing was heavy fog and they were going to, the airport would be shut. And so I had to go, would, we would get diverted to Auckland, but I needed to be on a flight the next day to get down to Comodoro for the July 17 event. So we ran back to the hotel, grabbed our stuff real quick and then went on the plane. We didn't know until 30 minutes before landing where we were going to land. And we ended up back in Christchurch. So anyway. And that's the observing team from July 17. It's a huge, huge crowd of people. Not everybody is an actual observer. There was lots of Argentinians there that were helping. It was just an amazing experience. I, I need to write this up. Um, and I, it could go on for hours about all the experiences that we had. But uh, um, that flag you see on the right is the uh, municipality flag for Comodoro Rivadavia. And we had everybody that was there sign it. I've now gone and got a, a, a few other people to sign it as well. We're going to hang that up in uh, mission operations during encounter. But um, it's the Air Force, the meteorological um, department of the Air Force was there in giving us updates. Yeah. Um, and then we had the mayor's office was there helping us out. We, they closed down a major national highway for us for two hours to get rid of the car lights. It's like I-95. Yes. It's, it's like I-95 when there are no other roads than I-95. Let's shut down highway 50 tonight. And <laughs> when they suggested it, the mayor's office suggested this, and I think, oh, please, don't tell them who I am. <laughs> <laughs> but they said, well, we do this all the time. You know, the weather's bad. We'll close the road for three days until we get it cleared up again. It's no problem. They provided, <laughs> they provided large trucks for windbreaks. Where I was observing, they shut down all the roads and all the street lights so that we didn't have um, light pollution in our site. It was, the amount of support we got from the Argentinian people was just amazing. Now, as to the question of who these people were, it's everybody I know that does occultations, and reaching out to different groups. I forget who, was it maybe David or somebody in IOTA, we uh, contacted them. Steve, Steve, maybe it was Steve, yeah. And then he put together a list of people that he said were interested in going. Sorry if you weren't on the list and you were interested, but I just had to go with what Steve gave to me. And I think everybody on that list ended up coming, at least for one of those events. So we had eight IOTA members in this, in this team.
had four people from recon. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so we had a bunch of CU students. We had everybody I could think of. Um, I was just looking around the room at these things and recognizing all the contacts I've had over the decades through occultation work. It was really cool. But uh, it was great to be able to pull together that uh, pile of quality people. It was really amazing. And I have to say that the success of this, I mean, there was so many people doing so many things and helping. It really was a massive team effort. It wasn't just me. But being able to lead it and direct it and reach the final goal was in no small part due to the experiences that I've gained over the years with running the recon program. Dealing with a large number of people that have to train them up on equipment that they've never seen before. And I had to work that all into the plan and how to <laughs> stamp out individualism. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, I've learned that's, it's a bad thing in these big projects. If you, if you want to um, get good data and not drive yourself nuts with all the, you know, everybody is so inventive, especially in this group, and Roger's definitely, we, we, we battled a little bit over the co concept of tape and <laughs> occultation equipment. But uh, everybody's got their own way of doing things and everybody's trying to solve a problem. And it was, it's just like, okay, don't invent anything. This process will work. Please use it so that it doesn't take me three months to reduce the data because everybody wants the results now. Okay, but all of that stuff came out of the recon project. Um, and without that experience, I'm not sure that this would have happened. I mean, I could look across the entire thing and there was probably a hundred things that any one of those had failed, we wouldn't have succeeded in the end, but just hanging on for the ride, it was it was a great experience. So I'm probably running kind of long on this. I'll try to zip through the recon stuff next, unless you got other questions about this. And